Welcome everyone. And um, yeah, I'm Hugh Byrne and I've been teaching <coughs> meditation for 23 years, I think now for 20 years uh, with IMCW. And uh, we've had a Sunday morning group um, going back to 2000. Um, when it was physically in person, we it was always within a couple of miles of uh, Tenley Town and um, Chevy Chase and um, Woodley Park. And, but now, uh, now we're online and hopefully we'll be doing some more sessions in person. Um, this, uh, you know, in the in the months ahead in the new year, I just want to uh, welcome uh, the two Marks here. <laughs> I haven't seen Mark uh, in Algiers for a while, so great to see you, and good to see you too, Mark. Great to have you here. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems like we're getting the band together again today for <laughs> you know uh, all of our folks have been around a while. So again, welcome to welcome to you all. I hope I hope um, you're doing well. I hope you're tanned, rested, and ready for the holiday season. Uh, Hanukkah's just finished, and coming into the Christmas period and the New Year, and Kwanzaa, and I'm sure other things that I may be missing. But um, so uh, it's a kind of a it tends to be an intense time. Um, you know, potentially full of joy, but also full of stress and other things uh, can come up as well. So I hope you're weathering that well. When when we meet again on the 31st, I want to talk about, um, kind of look at the year intentions as we go into the year ahead. I think it's a good time for reflection on that. But today, um, today the theme will be, I'll be continuing uh, the discussion, the theme of um, of true refuge, and um, I'm going to what, what just in terms of for those who are new, um, the format of the class is is pretty straightforward. We normally begin with a meditation, maybe twenty minutes or so, help us arrive and settle. Then there'll be a talk, typically around thirty minutes. And then uh, Emily will lead us in some mindful movement, for which, as always, uh, gratitude. Thank you. And then, uh, then some time for questions, sharing, um, and we finish pretty much on time at twelve. But we typically keep the room open for either. You know, maybe some formal continuation of those for those who want to continue with the class or just informal sharing. And my guess is today that we'll continue just with uh, kind of questions, sharing, that kind of thing that will hopefully begin before the end, have a little bit of time before the end, and then we'll continue afterwards. I can stay till about 12.30 today. So anyone who wants to stay after 12, but if you have to obviously have to get on with things, then, you know, the class formally finishes at 12. So with that, um, just to say that the theme today is uh, continuing true refuge. And I spoke last time about um, taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in awakening. And today um, we'll be exploring taking refuge in the Dharma, taking refuge in reality, taking refuge in the truth. And it's um, it's a, a theme that I'm, <clears throat> I'm very, um, I have a lot of enthusiasm about because I think it's really the heart of our, our of the teachings and the heart of our practice. And uh, <clears throat> I've actually already taught this morning for an insight timer um, on this theme. So I'm kind of this feels fairly alive for me. So we'll begin with a meditation and the meditation will kind of also be pretty much on the theme of the, of the class today of taking refuge in the truth, taking refuge in, in reality, taking refuge in the way things are. So which for the meditation, if you just want to come into a, a posture that's relaxed and comfortable. So just sitting in a way 
where you can be comfortable for the next 20 minutes or so, as much as you can. And let the back be straight so you can breathe easily and chest be open. Let the hands rest wherever they're comfortable in the lap or on your knees or on your thighs. If you'd like to, you can let your eyes gently close, let your attention come inward. Or if you prefer keeping your eyes open, whatever, whatever works best for you. Either way, just let the, the focus come inward so you're not looking all around, you know, using energy that way, but letting the attention come inward and kind of gathering the energy inward. And you might find it helpful to take a few longer, deeper breaths, you know, just two or three or however many will help you get settled. A nice, full, deep in-breath. Filling the chest, filling the lungs, and releasing, relaxing, letting go on the out breath. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. Letting the breath help you settle into being here. You might consciously you know, put aside plans for the future, thoughts about the past, things going on elsewhere. And just have the intention of being as fully here as you can be, fully present for your experience for this period of meditation. Whenever you're ready, letting the breath just settle into its natural rhythm, however it is for you right now. And you can always come back and take a deeper breath if you feel tight or tense or caught up in something. It's a great resource just to invite a nice long deep in breath and a relaxed slow out breath. And in this meditation today, we'll, we'll practice really letting go of controlling our experience and opening to life as it is right now without clinging or resistance. So you might begin by just inviting an attitude of, of letting go of control. You know, we tend to put a lot of energy into controlling our experience, making things the way we want them to be. And to some extent, that certainly makes sense. But we also tend to kind of overdo it doesn't always work for our benefit. And we can bring that energy into meditation too. You know, I should be doing this. I should be focusing on my breath. I should be coming back. I shouldn't be thinking so much. You know, see if you can let go of all of that. And just let your awareness be open and receptive without a particular agenda without thinking, oh, I have to focus on my breath or focus on something else. But just let your awareness be open to whatever is coming up. And it's fine if you, you know, and just kind of let 
be aware of your breathing in the background, you know, just to help you be here, if that's useful. But really not, not a doing. It's this open, non-controlling awareness. And whatever you're aware of, let it come, let it be. And let it go. Not struggling with whatever you're experiencing or feeling you have to do something about it. You know, we tend to want to hold on to pleasant things and push away unpleasant. But rather than doing that, see if you can just make space for whatever is here right now. If there's an uncomfortable bodily sensation that you're aware of, see if you can make space for it. Just let it come, let it be, let it go. There's a lot of thinking in the mind. You know, thoughts about the future or the past or plans or memories or daydreams. Just be aware of that thinking. And let the thoughts, thought come and go. So not holding on to it, not pushing it away not escaping from it, but just letting it kind of go wherever it goes without us doing anything with it, just letting it go. If there's an emotion that's present, Sadness, worry, joy. Just let that too come. Let it be. And let it go when it's ready to go. So it's not that we're doing anything with it, but just bringing awareness to it. When we meet our experience in this way, it's with a awareness of whatever the content of our experience is, whatever the bodily feelings, the emotions, the mind states. Just letting it all come and go. What we're doing really is taking refuge in the Dharma, taking refuge in the truth, taking refuge in how things are. Because however things are for you at this moment is the way things are. Whatever, however things are, right now for you is your dharma, your truth, my truth, you know. And we're 
inviting a wholehearted acceptance of what is here. What happens when you make space for whatever is here without clinging and without resisting and without judging? What do you notice? And if you do find yourself caught up in something, you know, swept up in something, entangled in something, it could be worried thoughts about the future or painful memories or some judgment of yourself, whatever. And you're kind of getting pulled along by that. It's not a problem at all. Just when you become aware of that and you're no longer so caught up in it, you're no longer really caught up in it, now you're aware of it. And you can just rest back in this open awareness so that everything can come and go in its own time. Letting life be life. You know, as opposed to struggling with life, wanting to make it the way we want it. Letting life be life. Can you see that the awareness that knows the content of your experience, knows the fears or knows the discomfort or knows the judgment, that that awareness is not actually caught up in the fear or the judgment or the clinging. And that those movements of the mind are just coming and going. You could ask, is this really me? You know, this thought that happens to come or this emotion that comes, comes and goes. And if you don't get entangled with it, you don't get caught up in it, you don't take it as the truth, then it can just come and go. You know, like the you know, the rain that will be coming in a couple of hours, you know, will come and pass through and then it will be sunny again or cloudy again. And just coming and going. 
in the same way, all of these experiences coming and going. And bringing uh, this non-controlling awareness to our experience. Dorothy Hunt says, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. So everything can come and go, you know, coming out of Causes and conditions can come, stay for a while and pass. And our work, if you like, our practice is just to be aware. Just letting it all come and go. When we let go of control in this way, when we let life be as it is, when we practice in this way, we come into alignment with life itself. We're not fighting with life, but we're in alignment with life. You might say we're dancing with life. This is from Lee Po. The, the birds have vanished into the sky and now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains.
So when you're ready, just taking your time coming back into the into the group. You know, welcome everyone again. Um, anyone who joined us after the opening, um, warm welcome to you all. And uh, we're just saying before we got a lot of lot of old friends um, here who folks have been around a long time and some new folks too. And so it's a nice nice mix of people today. Um, so please, if you if you have any you know th anything you'd like to share um, about you know how that was for you what you notice coming up um you know the meditation was very much on the um on the theme of you know the, of the of what i'll be talking about now so they're kind of very closely related to each other connected to each other and as i mentioned um As I mentioned earlier, um, the theme today, uh, theme of three sessions, um, one I did uh, two weeks ago today, and then probably not New Year's Eve because we'll have a specific theme for that, but um, probably the first one in the, in the new year, um, I'll finish up with Refuge in the Sangha. But um, the theme today is, overall a theme is true refuge, finding true refuge. And uh, the specific theme today is uh, taking refuge in, in the Dharma. And a good place to start, I think, is to recognize what, you know, in a way goes without saying, but might as well say it, that... Um, Life uh, can be challenging. Life can bring with it a lot of, even in the best of times, can bring with it a lot of challenges. You know, if we think of, you know, just this this being human of all the things that that happen to us. You know, that, um, you know, health, sickness. You know, getting sick, loved ones getting sick. Um, you know, financial downturns and difficulties and uh, you know all the things that you know create insecurity in that realm um, relationships uh, coming to an end um, you know all all sorts of things in life getting getting sick getting old um, dying I mean all of these things is not for uh, not for the faint of heart, you might say, um, this this being human. Uh, I'm sure all of us in our own way have experienced, you know, some, uh, the truth of that, 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 that life is, uh, you know, sometimes people think of Buddhism as life is suffering, and the Buddha never said life is suffering. You know, the Buddha said, you know, there is suffering, and suffering is a part of life, but joy is also a part of life as well. And there is an end to suffering. That's the that's the the positive. You know, that's the message that you know we can find our way out of suffering. That's the key. And so, you know, this you know challenges, difficulties, pain, discomfort. All of these are part of life. And so, the question naturally comes up. I mean, where do we where do we find refuge? Where do we find support? What, what can we lean on? What can we trust in in the face of this? And then today, obviously, in these times, um, you know, it's not the easiest time to be alive. You can probably say that about any any era um, that, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, there's depending on where we are and, and all of that in, in life and economic circumstances and peace and war and all of that. But right now there's lots for us to get entangled with, to get really upset about, to get sometimes even feel overwhelmed by, um, you know, just just saying climate change. I mean, that brings with it a whole, you know, like what what is this? You know, after being, you know, million a million years of 
homo sapiens or however exactly that it is you know where where we created the conditions for you know potentially for calamity in terms of human existence and other species as well i don't want to you know say it's a done deal but it's a it's an extraordinarily serious situation that that we need to you know obviously need to respond to etc but you know that's a challenge it's the conflicts going on i mean many of us feel very you know torn apart by what's going on right now in the in in israel and in gaza and the loss of life and you know the need for you know need for peace a long-term peace and you know everything going on in the country here you know in the united states in um you know whether it's from gun violence to the divisions etc in all of this i mean it, it, it life right now isn't easy and in the midst of all of this where do we turn what do we turn to is there something somewhere something that can provide you know true refuge genuine support for us what can we what can we lean on you know and that what we we tend to lean on is you know we kind of tend to do the best we can under the circumstances and you know we go for oh this will this will take care of this i'll feel better if you know i was just thinking like you know many years ago when i you know my first marriage came to an end and i would say the actually my my only one <laughs> formal marriage anyway um and uh you know my then wife and my young daughter went from back from england to the us and i was you know i was kind of bereft at that time and and uh and yet i didn't have any way of really dealing with that except the the classic way in the uh irish and english tradition which is uh you know with uh drowning your sorrows you know and covering you know covering it over i don't have to feel it if you know if i can numb it you know that was you know, along quite a few decades ago, um, and things have moved on in a good ways since then. But we we tend to go where we for refuge to whatever can give us it, and, and sometimes that's stuff that's really doesn't work for us. You know, drink and drugs and you know behaviors that uh, that just keep us kind of tangled you know for you know get us in worse trouble than 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 we were in the first place you know so so in when we are faced with these challenges of being human being alive what what is there a is there a, a genuine refuge is there where can we go to to find true support and i want to i shared this a couple of weeks ago and it, but it's worth reading again and this goes back to the time of the Buddha. It's not um, fake quotes of the Buddha. On the internet, you have a lot of these kind of like, what the Buddha didn't say. Have you seen those? What the Buddha didn't say, <laughs> you know, or Buddha, Buddhist fake, fake quotes, etc. Well, this is, this is not one of those. This goes back to the Dhammapada, one of the central books of uh, the Pali Canon, the first written teachings of the Buddha written down about 500 years after he died but pretty much understood to be the accurate accurate teachings of the buddha as close as we can get so this is what what the buddha shared um there he says they go to many a refuge <clears throat> to mountains forests parks trees and shrines people threatened with danger this is where they go to and the Buddha says, that's not the secure refuge. That's not the highest refuge. That's not the refuge having gone to which you gain release from all suffering and stress. So these aren't places you, we get true refuge, even though they might be quiet and calm, mountains, forests, parks, trees, shrines. He says, but when having gone for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, you see with right discernment, you see clearly the Four Noble Truths. So you go to these three refuges, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You see the Four Noble Truths. You see suffering. You see the cause of suffering and clinging. You see the end of suffering, freedom, nirvana. And you see the path that leads to the end of suffering. He says, 
that's the secure refuge. That's the highest refuge. That's the refuge having gone to which you gain release from all stress, all suffering and stress. So basically the Buddha is saying, don't rely on these other things. They may have good aspects to them, you know, your loved ones, your friends, your family, those, you know, they're very important in our lives. Obviously, they're part of our community and relationships, but they can't provide lasting satisfaction. They can't provide true refuge because they'll end, you know, they'll they'll come to an end, you know, relationships come to an end, lives come to an end, everything comes to an end. So we can't hold on to them. But he said we can hold on to these true refuges because they're not things, you know, they're not things, they're not states that we create that I want to keep this state going. They're, they're really, um, if you like, a kind of alignments of, of our consciousness, of our awareness. So I spoke last time about, um, about the... Uh, a couple of things. One, I spoke last time about taking refuge in awakening in the Buddha. I'll just say a few words about that to recap that just very briefly. But I want to first say that there are different ways these refuges of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha can be understood. You know, when they're taught about, you know, they, they can be taught about in a very specific way or in much broader ways. If you read Tara Brach's book, True Refuge, it's a wonderful book. That's a really, really broad way of looking at these refuges. She talks about refuge in Buddha being refuge in, um, in awakening, refuge in the Dharma, refuge in truth, and refuge in Sangha, refuge in love. So really in these very broad qualities, if you like, um, you know, Historically, the, 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 the understanding of the refuges tends to have been a kind of more focused on the Buddha, the historical Buddha, the teachings, etc. But what I want to point to and what other, others have pointed to is, I think, a very helpful way of looking at these refuges. And that is to look at them as outer refuges and inner refuges. So, it just let me just to talk about outer refuges. If we look at the outer refuge of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, outer refuge in the Buddha would be to really look for inspiration to the historical person, Siddhartha, who became the awakened one, Siddhartha, um, that became the Buddha, the awakened the one who awakened. And we kind of look to the Buddha as an inspiration that this is, he showed the way, he awakened, and that indicates that I could follow that path, you could follow that path, and it would be fruitful and it would be beneficial to do that. So we could think of that as an outer refuge, as a really as an inspiration. Refuge in the Dharma, we could think of the Buddha's teachings of the Four Noble Truths, of the Eightfold Path, the Heart Practices, you know, all of these lists. I mean, you don't know all of these lists. Probably nobody knows except Bhikkhu Bodhi knows all of the lists. <laughs> A few others as well, but, but there's so many, you know, there's so many. Um, and you know, not everyone finds the lists helpful, but that's just historically how they develop. Um, but, but all of this range of teachings um, taking refuge in the Buddha can, can be seen as like taking refuge in these teachings. This path of these teachings will help us to get to find greater freedom in our lives. So that's kind of thinking, seeing the teachings as an inspiration, like seeing the Buddha as an inspiration, see the teachings as an inspiration. Taking refuge in the Sangha in this outer way would be to look to the Sangha or the community of awakened ones, of monastics and householders, lay people who over the years, over the centuries, have woken up, who have experienced freedom from suffering and can inspire us by showing, showing us the way, similarly to the way, obviously, the Buddha's 
Buddha's awakening shows us. So in that way, all of these outer refuges, I think of as really inspirations, as, as, as kind of inspiring us to, to really pay attention, to make wise effort, to let go of you know, entanglements to let go of suffering, to find freedom from suffering. Saying, it's really saying, you know, this is important. This is in, an important way to live our lives so, so that we can live more freely. It's a kind of an encouragement. It's an inspiration. But what the other way of looking at these uh, refuges is not so much as inspiration. And I'm not, I don't mean, I don't really mean to hierarchize, high, make hierarchies of, you know, the the inner is better than the out. I'm, I'm more saying they're different. They can be seen as different from each other rather than higher and lower. But in a way, the outer refuge is more external to us. You know, we follow something that's kind of more out there. The inner rather than being so much about inspiration, although that can be an important part of it, it's more about the inner refuge is about transformation. So inspiration and transformation, I came up with that myself this morning, just the words that seem like a helpful one. Inspiration kind of inspires us to move forward. Transformation inspires us to change ourselves and to find freedom from suffering in our, in our own lives. So just a little bit of recapping what I spoke about last time. Um, so refuge in the Buddha I spoke about last time really means awakening, not just following the Buddha's example, but recognizing that we, each of us have what's sometimes called Buddha nature. We, each of us, Buddha nature really just means we have the potential the capacity in us to wake up. And when we recognize that, if we really take that on board, that's a powerful thing. It says that you, each one of us here, you, all of us here, that we have the capacity to wake up in the way that the Buddha did. It's not a prediction. It's not a, you know, giving us odds on whether it's going to happen in this lifetime. But it's really saying that we're on that path and that we have this capacity. And it's very much a question of our own actions and our own choices, whether we move forward on the path that we hold in our own hands, in our own power, the capacity to free ourselves from suffering, you know? I mean, obviously we don't do it alone, we do it in community, we're supported by the teachings, but it's we ourselves that have to free ourselves. Nobody can do it for us, right? Even the Buddha can't free you from suffering or free me from suffering, right? Does that make sense? That, that the Buddha can only point the way you know, in Zen, they have these wonderful images, you know, the finger pointing at the moon, you know, and they say, you know, don't focus on the finger, <laughs> focus on the thing that's being pointed to. And the Buddha is just pointing, I mean, doing a wonderfully comprehensive way, but he's still just pointing. Any teacher, anyone is just pointing. Even the person that presses your button, buttons and gets you angry about things, you know, your favorite politician that you love to hate. Um, even there, that just they're just pointing to something that you need to take, pay attention to, I need to pay attention to, we need to pay, atten pay attention to in ourselves, that there's something we haven't looked at here. Anyone who's teaching us is always just pointing, you know, and we have to, we have to focus on what's being pointed at, not what's doing the pointing. You know, and other images of a menu, you know, we don't want to eat the menu. You know, that's not going to be very nutritious. You know, we menu only just points to what what it would be like if we were actually to eat the food. So so the key to the first of the refuges is to really use the understanding that that we can wake up ourselves, because when we take I said last time, I said, this, for me, I think, is one of the most important 
understandings that we can come to in spiritual life, you say in spiritual life, in life generally, is to realize that we have some choice about our lives, that we actually can free ourselves from suffering. You know, whether we believe we can get completely free from suffering in this lifetime, that we may not believe that, we may think, oh, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, that might come in a hundred lifetimes. Or you might think, well, that's I'm not even interested in so much in that. I just want a little bit more freedom. But the main thing is that we recognize that the change is possible, that letting go is possible, that untangling ourselves from suffering is possible in this life. Because a lot of people go through life and, th and, and don't really think that and don't believe that, don't know that, but think ah, it's just either it's predetermined or maybe I can affect a few things and get a little bit more happy if I make more money or if I get a nice relationship or a good job, I bit, get a bit more. But I can't really, it doesn't really change, it doesn't make me more free necessarily. It just you know gives me a little bit more comfort. For a lot of people, I think, there isn't necessarily that sense that of, of possibility of transformation. And I think what everybody here, I would guess, or I would assume almost everybody here, there's some sense that we have this possibility. Is that true? Or am I, am I just, am I being over optimistic? <laughs> it's certainly something, yeah, Bob, Bob has his uh, uh, thumb up. Um, it's certainly I, it's something I strongly believe. And, you know, from since I found this path, or was on this journey 30 or 35 years ago. I think that's been a bedrock for me that, that yes, it's possible, not that I always will, and I get caught up and all of these things that we do, get caught up in stuff, get tangled, find out find it hard to get out of the you know the swamp as it were but at some level believing that it's possible to 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 be, be to free ourselves to to alleviate our suffering at least you know and once we have that recognition then in a way i think the sky is the limit because you know you let you know as arjun char says you let go a little and it actually points to the pot potential for letting go a lot. And that kind of points to at least the possibility of letting go completely. You know, that in a way that the little letting go is the microcosm of, of the big letting go, which is the macrocosm, you know, is like the, the Buddha's awakening, but even just letting go a little bit, you know, letting go of resentment to something, somebody towards somebody or letting go of self-judgment that we can let go. So all this to say um, that the true refuge in, 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 in awakening in the Buddha is, is recognizing our own capacity to wake up, to live freely, to un untangle ourselves from confusion and from suffering. This is what the Buddha said just a, a while before he died. He said to Ananda, his attendant, he said, who asked him, you know, what, where can we find, find refuge? Where can, what can we trust in after you're gone? The, and this is what he says, very, very famous statement of the Buddha. He says, Ananda, be a lamp unto yourself. Be a lamp unto yourself. Be a refuge to yourself. Take yourself to no external refuge. Hold fast to the truth as a lamp. Hold fast to the truth as a refuge. So in a way that's talking there about the first and second refuge that we're taking refuge with, you know, being a lamp unto ourselves. We're recognizing that we actually have that capacity. You have the capacity. I have the capacity. We have the capacity to wake up and, and experience freedom from suffering, realize freedom from suffering. A little, a lot, completely, you know, wherever, you know, we, we, we set our sights, we can kind of, move in that move in that direction so be a lamp unto yourself so 
<laughs> so uh, refuge in awakening, this inner refuge is refuge, finding refuge in the potential for transforming our own hearts, transforming our own lives. So I want to talk in the remaining time today about the second refuge, refuge in the Dharma. Um, Refuge in the truth, refuge in reality, refuge in the way we are, the way things are. And um, as I mentioned, the outer refuge we could look at as the teachings, you know, this, this trustworthy body of teachings that can help us wake up, can, that lays out the path to the end of suffering. The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and the other central teachings. That's the, the kind of the, 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 the outer refuge. The inner refuge is taking refuge in the truth, taking refuge in reality, taking refuge in the present moment, taking refuge in experience as we're meeting it in this moment and then in this moment and in this moment so if we if i just invite you to you know not just hear that as words you know okay that's what what this is what i'm trying to point to here but actually turn towards your experience right now in body heart and mind like we did in the meditation but just for a minute or so here, just turn inward and just notice what is true for you right now. You know, what are you experiencing? If you want to close your eyes for a minute, just notice. You probably notice some bodily experiences. And, and you know, as we did in the meditation, just meet what's here with kindness. Let it come, let it go. You know, there may be some kind of emotion that's running through you right now about something going on in your life you know maybe it's something in the heart area maybe it's around your eyes just notice that and if there is let's say there's sadness you know can you meet that just make space for for what's here right now for the sadness to come and to go you know without pushing it away without clinging to it you know, whatever's going on in the mind, you know, it could be something about this talk of, oh, yeah, this is interesting. Oh, no, this isn't, in, you know, whatever might be going on, just notice that. And again, as we were, did earlier in the meditation, notice the, that there's, there's the awareness and then there's whatever the content of the awareness is, you know, whatever's the content of experience is, should I say. So, what we're doing in any moment when we're taking refuge in the Dharma is we're really taking refuge in the truth of our experience as it is right now. So if you feel when you know whenever you feel ready, you can open your eyes and any time you can just turn the attention inward. You know, we easily get caught up in our minds, we get swept off, you know, and just as we do in meditation, we can just come back and say, okay. What's here right now? What's true right now? So taking refuge in the Dharma is really taking, using um, the teachings, using this present moment awareness as a doorway to help us wake up, a pathway or an entry point to help us wake up, you know, Wake up by being present here, by coming into alignment with life as it is in this moment. The Buddha said this present moment awareness, mindfulness, is the direct path to liberation, the direct path to liberation, that through awareness of our experience in this moment, in any moment, that is a doorway, whether it's awareness of the body, awareness of feelings, awareness of emotions, awareness of mind states, awareness of anything in this 
fathom long body, anything in the world we can pay attention to in this, in this aware, non-judging, kind way can be the doorway to, to the deepest freedom. Because we see that everything comes and goes, that it's, that it's all, you know, that not everyone likes this experience, including Rebecca, um, when I, uh, Joseph Goldstein uses this sometimes, uh, empty phenomena rolling on, <laughs> empty phenomena rolling on. And it's, a, it's kind of like it's, it can come across as a little bit cold. You know, we think of our lives and our relationship as empty phenomena rolling on. But in a deeper sense, you know, it, it, it all is, you know, it's emotions, it's thoughts, it's mind states, it's kind of coming and going. Empty doesn't mean meaningless, you know, in the sense that we sometimes, but, but, but empty in the sense of impermanent insubstantial you know it's not it doesn't have a reality of it of its own it's a dependent arising of conditions in a moment and then passing to another moment like this so empty phenomena rolling on if that if that resonates with you but it's all all coming and going and when we see this then it leads to the buddha says it leads to clarity it leads to insight it leads to dispassion we don't get so caught up in, I want this, I hate this, I want to get rid of this. We can see that coming and going, but we can let it go, let it go. See the clinging and just let it go rather than acting on it. Where does it go? Where does the clinging go when we don't cling? You know, it goes to, you know, the place that cling, clinging goes where we don't cling. It just, you know, there's no substance to it. It's like we haven't reified it. We haven't made it real. Of like, I've got to have this thing. I've got to have this person. We kind of see that gotting to, if to put it elegantly, gotting to, needing to have. and But rather than fueling it with our thinking, we just, oh, okay, let me just see that clinging. Let me see that resistance and let it come, let it go, let it go. And when we do this, kind of life can flow rather than, you know, we're trying to control everything and, and want, get the things we want, get rid of the things we don't want, and, and suffering in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the process. So... Buddha, the Buddha said, mindfulness is the direct path to liberation. And there are many, you know, there are many different ways we point to this. <clears throat> and, you know, I'll just mention some of these. You've heard me saying this. You've probably heard others saying it. But, you know, just welcoming our experience is one expression of that. It's like, okay, what is here may not be very what we wanted, but can we welcome it? Can we make space for it? Can we let it come and go? Can we welcome the guests in Rumi's pray, you know, Rumi's poem, even if they're a crowd of sorrows? Can we welcome them? Can we let the guests come and do its dance and play its music? And then when it's ready, you know, it, it can go. So all coming and going, empty phenomena rolling on. Can we say yes to what is? You know, that's another way of seeing this, this taking refuge in the Dharma is yes to what is. You know, it may be something we don't really feel like it's yes to, you know, of like, oh, I didn't get that job I wanted. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not saying it, it has to be a celebratory yes. <laughs> I'm really happy that I didn't get the job I wanted. No, we don't have to be happy about it, but we're just saying, we're saying, yes, this is true. You know, this is, I'm saying yes to this. I'm accepting it. This is life as it's unfolding. So that's what we're saying. It's not a. It's not necessarily a celebration of everything because not everything is celebra celebratory. Um, so saying yes to our experience, welcoming the guests, radical acceptance, as Tara Brock talks about it, as deep rooted acceptance of this moment as it is. The expression I've uh, the, the saying uh, phrase that. Um, I've shared before is uh, Anthony de Mello's, the Jesuit teacher, philosopher, writer, 
um, speaks about enlightenment as absolute cooperation with the inevitable. Absolute cooperation with the inevitable. You know, and it's kind of like you have to kind of think about it for a bit. But what we're doing is we're cooperating with life. And the inevitable meaning, it's here. It's unavoidable. As I was saying earlier, you know, if, if I happen to have a pain in my stomach right now, well, that's what's here right now. You know, if I'm tired right now, well, tiredness is here right now. Might want it to be different, but good luck with that. Right now it's like this. You know, I, yes, I might be able to do something about changing it, but that's, you know, that's the future. Right now, this is what's here. And so cooperating with the inevitable is not to fight with the inevitable, not to fight with what is. It's not to struggle, not to cling, not to resist, not to avoid, but just say, OK, this is how life is unfolding right now. So non-clinging, non-resistance, non-judging, non-denial. So being present for what is. Now, you know, and I could give, you know, I give, 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 give some examples. I just maybe just do it very, very quickly. But, you know, you could think of all of the times that we're suffering. We're, we're actually in a struggle with reality. All of the time, what time we're struggling, there's there's some. I'm sorry, all the time we're suffering, there's some struggle with the way things are. We're not at peace with life as it is right now and we suffer. So, for example, when we're wanting or craving something, you know, that clinging, we're here, the body is here, the neediness is here, but the mind is saying, I got to be here, there, I got to have that. So there's a gap there between where I am and where I want to be. There's a struggle there. Similarly with aversion, you know, we're, we, we hate that person. They're terrible. They're always doing these harmful things. There's a me here feeling this agitation. And there's this person that I don't like that I feel really separate from. So there's a here and the there. There's a gap and there's suffering in that gap, you know. We're not in alignment with how life is in that moment. If we're caught up in fear, we're here and the mind is in the future of like, oh, this bad thing is going to happen, then that bad thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all, any of these things, any of these, these manifestations of suffering, stress, worry, again, there's the separation. We're, we're in this place, right? We're here feeling really tight and tense and the mind is saying, I need to be somewhere else. I need to get all of this stuff done in order to be OK. You know, so again, there's this tension, there's this gap and there's a suffering in the gap. Even when we're distracted, we're here, but the mind is somewhere else. There's always that that separation and that that gap, that struggle and their suffering. Now. You might well say might already be saying in your own mind, well, what about the things that do need to change? What about the things that do need to change? What about action on climate change? What about ending the killing in Gaza and Israel and building a lasting peace? What about ending gun violence? What about, you know, the many, many different forms of suffering, the, the things going on in the world? Do we have to just accept that those are always going to be as they are? Well, no, the point is acceptance means accepting this moment. It's not passivity. It's not saying this has got to, you know, I, I'm just accepting this will be like this forever. We can take action to bring about change and it can be very wise and helpful to do that in that situation is appropriate. But, and this is the big but, it needs to come from a place of acceptance. It needs to come from acceptance of this moment as it is, or else what we bring into the world will only create more suffering. So if I bring anger into wanting to change things, then I bring anger, you know, into the mix and I bring anger to anger 
And then I create more division, more suffering. So change must come from a place of acceptance of this moment as it is. So a quote I like a lot from the from James Baldwin, the great American playwright, poet, author, civil rights activist. He said, not everything you face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Not everything that you face can be changed. You can't change everything in the world, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. So until we look reality in the eye, experience in the eye, we can't really change anything. We can't change anything in a helpful, we can change things, but we can't change things in a way that's going to be beneficial, lead to lasting, you know, genuine happiness and peace. It has to come from this place of acceptance. So this is really refuge in, in the Dharma, refuge in this moment, refuge in experience, just as it is. So, as I said, m mindfulness is, the Buddha said, is the direct path to liberation. Like with mindfulness, life reveals itself. We see what's arising and we come into alignment with life itself. As I said, it gives rise to insight, gives rise to letting go. And the doorway is always the present moment. It's always here and now. You know, we can think about tomorrow and we can learn from yesterday, but the work is always, the action, the, the transformation is always right here and right now. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Eckhart Tolle has, he says, um, how did he put it? He says, um, anything unconscious dissolves in the light of consciousness. Anything unconscious dissolves in the light of consciousness. When we shine the light on any confusion, any entanglement, any clinging, it, cl it becomes clarified and is dissolved really, is untangled when we shine the light of awareness, to so shine the light of consciousness on our experience. So I wanna finish off in the next minute or two and I want to just come back to that sense that I was trying to um, invite in the meditation. And that is being aware of the awareness, the knowing of the mind that sees the entanglement, sees the joys, sees the sorrows, but is not caught up in them, you know, in it. So when we're aware of fear, we're not actually caught up in fear. The awareness is not afraid. The awareness is not angry. The awareness is not clinging. The awareness isn't even happy or joyful, you know, in that sense. The awareness is just aware. And then there's what's what we're aware of. And what we're aware of, we can just, it can come and go. And this is what, what taking refuge in the Dharma is. It's taking refuge in the truth in this moment and the present moment is the doorway to that authentic engagement with our present moment experience so turning our awareness towards our experience is the pathway to awakening the pathway to freedom from suffering and um and in that way is a true refuge. It's a true refuge because we can come back to it. We can rely on it and we can realize the deepest peace through this present moment awareness of what is here right now. That becomes the doorway in to letting go, to insight and to the deepest freedom. So invite you to just kind of reflect on that in your own life um we're going to go into emily will lead us in some movement now we'll get together for a few minutes 
And then it, those who can stay around after 12 will continue the conversation then. So thank you for your kind attention and passing it over to you, Emily. Thank you, Hugh, yes. Um, so much to think about, and it's good to take a moment with your body. People could remain standing or just rise and open into the space of where you are right now, taking a look on the horizon as you sway from side to side. And then open up, wide, expanding up. Exhale, soften your shoulders, soften your elbows, and then reach, grasping your left wrist in your right hand, extending out, out towards the right. You might inhale a little lifting up and exhale, softening into it. Inhale up, switch wrists, extending out over to the left. Noticing your awareness, breathing into the right rib cage, and exhale, see where that takes you. Inhale up, float your arms down, roll your shoulders together. And roll them the other way. Now come to center. Place your right wrist on top of your left wrist. And then turn your hands together. And find a comfortable stance. And we're going to draw the symbol of infinity. Or a sideways figure eight. So... Starting in one direction, moving, Notice, noticing your body, what is there for you in this symbol of limitlessness. And come to center, go the other way. And then come to center. Switch wrists. Place the left on top, grasping your hands. And draw that symbol of infinity, of limitlessness, being in the moment. And come to center and go the other direction. And come to center. Drop your arms down. Roll your shoulders independently. Just getting the kinks out. And roll them the other way. And then come to center. Place your hands at your head, hip flexors. And extend your spine out. Lengthening. Feeling the engagement of your pelvis, the energy from your feet. And if you'd like to lower your hands to above your knees, drop the chin down, the shoulders, dropping down towards the earth, being here in this moment, grateful for just being and breathing, and lowering them. And then place your hands above your knees and tilt your tailbone under. Rise up, stacking the vertebrae. Come to center, windmill your arms. Windmilling them the other way.
and come to center. Place your hands, just palms up to lift up and bring your palms together above your head. Just being here, drawing your hands to your heart, feeling the energy there, turning the energy out to the group, breathing in, exhaling, down to the earth, grateful for its abundance, and then on and exhale. Whoosh, lifting up, down to the heart. And take a bow, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Lovely. Thanks so much, Emily. And, um, I think what we'll we'll do, just given the time, is uh, we'll have the the sharing and the <clears throat> and the questions afterwards. If you have anything you want to put in the uh, in the chat, please feel free to uh, to do that. Um, any questions or anything you'd like to share, but we will will in the next few minutes we'll finish up the formal um, part of our. Uh, program for today and then um, if you would like to stay around we'll we'll continue from at least for another half hour or so um, I think I've just want a couple of things I want to share um, <clears throat> excuse me um, if anyone uh, would like to visit um, the uh, west of Ireland and do a retreat Rebecca and I are doing one there in uh, in June, late June of uh, 2024, just let me know. And uh, I'm doing a day long in uh, in early January in person. So if anyone f fancies a 90 minute drive out to Chestertown, Maryland, um, we're going to have a day long out there. I've been doing those for must be more than 15 years now. Uh, most years absent COVID, I've uh, been going out there to do uh, with a nice group out there in uh, on the uh, eastern shore and uh, to mention as we do there's no cost for joining the class no charge um, you're invited if you're inclined and if you're able to do so to make a donation it's how the teachings have come down through the practice of generosity or dana in pali come down through 2500 years and um, Deb has shared the different ways um, that you can make donations through IMCW and uh, thank you for your for your generosity.